Living Beyond Our Means, here and abroad, next on Behind the Headlines. This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, a senior fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined by Mara Donnelly, uh, my co-host. Mara, welcome. Hello, Charlie. Why, this is 2012, and it's it the is. bicentennial of the War of 1812. Oh, wow. This is interesting. This is a war that the English said that they won, the Canadians believe they won, and the Americans, uh, we believe we won. Uh, it's a war for winners. It was a win-win-win. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of Charlie Sheen type of war, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Well, we uh, at least uh, everyone could uh, have taken credit for winning the War of 1812, but there are some financial <laughs> situations that are brewing across America that no, winners. no one wants no, to take no credit winners, for. No. And uh, we'd like to uh, bring in one of our best, uh, our best experts, our best consultants on finances and state business, and that's Scott Wagner. Scott, a member of the Charlie. Susquehanna Valley Center Charlie. Board. Hello, welcome Scott. Back Good morning. The, welcome back to the show. Well, I'm honored by that um, description. I'm an expert and a consultant. I'm honored. So, so you, uh, just, I think you Because I have a calculator. Yeah. <laughs> you look very smart. Yeah. <laughs> well, you uh, have proven yourself in the world of business with, you have made Penn Waste one of the, one of the best run businesses in the state of Pennsylvania. And, um, You've proven yourself time and time again, and uh, uh, we really appreciate you contributing your um, your um, uh, wisdom as well to our, our board at Susquehanna Valley Center. But uh, there's been recently a um, an essay that ran in the Wall Street Journal called Obama's Debt Boom, and uh, this struck a chord with you, didn't it? What was the thesis of the uh, essay that uh, ran in the Wall Street Journal a little while ago? Well, the article was interesting because it uh, came out over a weekend, so I had an opportunity to read it a couple times and, and just, you know, look at the numbers and, and, and let things sink in. But the reality is that our national debt is, is $16 trillion. And it talks, the article talks about ratios about how our debt is getting so close to the, the, the GDP of this country, which you know, in my, you know, to, in layman's terms, that means the, the, the gross revenues of, of, of our country. And it would be c comparable to me uh, analyzing Penn Waste if I had uh, revenues of $10 million a year and I had $10 million in debt. I couldn't service $10 million in debt with $10 million in revenue. And it is, and let's say next year, and as the article goes on to describe, that as we move into the future, you know, getting closer to 2035, and it, that seems like a long way off, but it really isn't. If you take 2035 minus, uh, you know, 2012, we're, we're about 20 years away. And, you know, we were all, remember, we were all going through the Y2K thing in mm -hmm. 2000. So the yes. last 12 years have flown by. But there, there, it, it, it's really a parallel. It talks about, so let's say Penn Waste continues to be a $10 billion company. But next year we have 11 billion in debt, or excuse me, 11 million in debt. And the following year we have 12 million in debt, and it just it gets very lopsided. We can't, we would not be able to survive, you know, a scenario like that. So you know, to boil this down, so it's 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 you know, the average person can understand because this is very complex. But the numbers are the numbers; they tell the story, and and this isn't. You know, some comments that, well, this is, you know, more slanted uh, towards the Republican um, point of view and, and, you know, it's more propaganda. Well, it's not propaganda. It's, it's true facts. And, and where, do, where do the numbers come from? They come from the, um, uh, the federal government. Okay. They come from the from, Congressional Budget Office, yes, right? Yes. It's, it's, Which is run by the Democrats and yeah, the Republicans yeah, yeah. in yeah. the United States Congress. It's, 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 it's the financial statement that we are being supplied um, uh, it's being supplied to the citizens by our own government. So headquarters is sending it down to all the little worker bees, so okay. to speak. But, you know, hmm. to put this, you know, more in perspective, let, let's, you know, Charlie, before we start, I, you know, I asked I ask you a question. Do you by any chance have a home equity loan? And you said no. 
Well, let's let's pretend you had a home equity okay, loan. Okay, let's no say I, I do. So let's pretend I, you I, had you put, a Let's pretend you yeah. put a new pool in, too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, that houseboat. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Or you, you borrowed $10,000 because the bank was offering a really good deal okay. at, pr at prime, and All the right. prime interest rate is, is, a, is, a, is a monetary interest standard that's you know, set by the Fed. And the Wall Street Journal comes out every day, and it's all the interest rates, various interest rates are posted uh, in the Wall Street from around the world, different indexes. But the prime is one that, prime interest rate is one that many people understand. So if you have a home equity loan today, and it's a $10,000 home equity loan, and you're paying the amazingly low rate of three and a quarter percent, which is the current prime, your total an annual interest rate is $325. On a, on a monthly basis, you're going to get a bill from your bank of $27.08. Uh, Doesn't seem like a lot, and it is, it's extremely low. So let's, 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 let's play make-believe that we start moving back into a period that I experienced in the 1980s where prime went from 9% um, to 22%. Mm. I had some loans with, with a bank in York, York Bank and Trust. They went from 9 to 19%. They were tied to prime. But let's just let's just Brutal. say that prime your home equity loan that something happens you know we have this we have this credit crisis around the world Greek uh, the Greek credit crisis the, the you know the credit crisis in Spain and Italy something is going to happen and we'll there be is, talking about that in the second segment of the show exactly and it's so let's say that prime goes up one percent from three and a quarter to four and a quarter so f from an annualized cost of three twenty three hundred twenty five dollars a year you go to four twenty five a year okay so your payment goes from twenty seven dollars and eight cents a month to thirty five dollars and forty two cents a month it doesn't seem like a lot but it's an eight dollar and thirty four cent per month increase and if you run the numbers on my two dollar calculator it's a thirty percent <laughs> increase so what they're talking about in the article that if we have a hundred, the term is a hundred basis points, and a hundred basis points equals one percent. If the interest rate that the federal government had to pay on all its debt increased by one percent, we're talking om, over a, a trillion dollars in additional cost. Where's the money going to come from? I mean, you know, Charlie, I wish I had a rubber band. You know, you can, you know, rubber band can only stretch so far, and at a point it snaps. And so, we are in, and, and I and I continue to read about all these projections and this and that. Really, honestly, anyone that can project more than a year, year and a half, um, I think is 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 should be at the circus, you know, in a magical show or the magic show. Well, well Scott, what do we but have to do to stop the bleeding? What what has we, to happen here? We we have to do we have to do a couple things. We have to we have to rein in our spending. We have live within our means. We have to live within our means, and actually, uh, you know, there's a newsletter that just came out this morning that I get uh, from a from a group up uh, in the up in Boston, and the title is "Living Beyond Your Means." Mm -hmm. And this is so frustrating, yeah. isn't it, Scott? Because yeah. um, maybe perhaps individuals who have been um, been around a little longer, older people uh, who paid attention to government and to business know this. This is one of the most basic lessons, just to not spend more money than you have. And yet we have to be relearning this over and over and over again. It, isn't it frustrating to you? I had a, 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 very simply put, I had a financial person who worked for me 20 years ago uh, in my first waste company. And he, he had this phrase, nice to have, need to have. So, you know, <laughs> Charlie, that, that swimming pool that yeah. you put in your backyard <laughs> that you barred with your home equity uh, money, how, how many times, so I'm just curious, how many times do you use your pool, you know? And you have to buy chemical. But no, we have to, we have to rein in It's spending. heated, isn't it? <laughs> and with lights. Okay, more. good. Exactly, yeah. we have to rein in spending. Pay for all that. I think, you know, this is really a sensitive subject, but you know, our government has so many subsidies farm subsidies. Uh, recently, last year, DEP issued uh, two grants, one to waste management for $400,000, one to Republic Services for $500,000, total $900,000. These are both public companies traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Waste management in their last earnings conference call said they will have close to $1 billion in free cash flow. So, but Why would waste management need it, Scott? That's a that's a great question. I mean, well, that makes that makes well, little sense because their business seems well, to be booming. Your business is booming. The business is booming, but here's the problem: we have a system in Harrisburg where somebody works for waste management. They're called lobbyists. 
consultants, they have a relationship with someone over here, you know, they are able to get money for waste management. It, it, it's, in every, it's in every industry. And we have to, we have to really look at, at those programs. Um, unemployment compensation benefits mm -hmm. have been extended over and over and over. And you know it's it's a sensitive subject, and I realize that there are people that need. But those why is it sensitive? It shouldn't be a sensitive subject. Well, it really. It should it, be a hatchet taken to it. It there should be a hatchet mm -hmm. taken to it. But what has happened is we have we have a government now, the federal government, that really has gone around for and the president for the last two years and has handed out morphine kits all over the U.S. Once you get on morphine <laughs> or a drug, it, you can't, you, you, you know, the, yeah. to get off, yeah. you know, 20% get off, uh, you know, and the other 70% struggle to get off, and some people become addicts. And we have, we have jobs at Penn Waste. There are companies all over Pennsylvania that have, that, that have job openings. And a lot of those jobs are skilled positions. And we have, when, when the government uh, continues to just, um, uh, continue to pay the benefits and the most important thing is when someone is laid off from their job or fired and they go out of circulation and they stop going to the office, they stop going to a plant, they stop learning skills, they stop social interaction, they start falling behind. Mm -hmm. So when you have people that have been receiving two years of unemployment, they have lost their edge yeah. and they may never ever come back into the workforce in, in, in any meaningful capacity. So that's why there's, we talk about you know, training programs and all kinds of stuff, but back, I don't want to get off the subject here. We have, to, we have to rein in our spending. But there's another, I think, you know, there's another sensitive subject um, you know, for me. We, we pay a lot of taxes as a company. I pay a lot of taxes. And I'm not, I'm not here ranting and raving saying I want to pay less taxes. I'm willing to pay my fair share. And in some instances, I probably would be willing to pay more. But I don't want to see the money that we work hard for, that we write tax checks to Harrisburg and Washington, get run through a paper shredder or burned at a bonfire where everybody's having a cocktail party with, you know, 500 lobbyists. You know, it, it just doesn't work. We have to, there's going to have to be some hard choices made. And um, I also, people that are not paying their fair share of taxes need to pay their fair share of taxes. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, again, we had a we had a huge environmental tragedy uh, down in the Gulf. That was the BP oil spill, mm -hmm. and I, I watched I watched interviews and I saw letters and articles in the newspaper about how people weren't getting uh, they weren't getting their claims filed or they couldn't get claims filed and they weren't getting repaid. Well, hey, you ran a cash business. You didn't pay taxes. You know, there are a lot of cash businesses in this country that people don't even pay taxes on, mm -hmm. and so. You know, let's just think about the people that we pay cash to. They don't pay taxes. There's a huge cash economy. So in my world, I get paid by um, either a customer directly, by a credit card or a check, or a municipality pays our company, or, you know, the local McDonald's send, issues their check out of their checkbook. We, we, don't, we don't cook our books. We show all of our income. We have to. I mean, that would be the last mm. thing we would ever want to do. So I think, number one, people, we need to rein in our spending. People need to pay their fair share. And I also think that we have to look at, at, you know, we have to look at revenue. We have to look at expenses. Mm -hmm. I and mean, this isn't hard to figure out. But I have a, I have a burr under my saddle over the, the $900,000 in grant money that was given to two public companies. Because where I come from, $900,000 buys a lot of blacktop, a lot of concrete, a lot of steel for bridges. Yeah. It, it could do a lot. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and we're at a point where th this essay points out how we are at a very precarious position in our national history in terms of debt. Uh, we are probably, I guess this pointed out, that with the exception of World War II, uh, we will have the largest debt uh, per GDP um, that we've ever had in our country's, uh, in our country's existence. So this is uh, a way, should be a wake-up call to the American people. I guess the situation in Wisconsin a few weeks ago uh, was uh, at, the, at the crux of that situation uh, where they did not recall the governor. They let the governor stay, stay in, and uh, the governor was all about trying to put out the message. Certainly one of his biggest messages is we can't live beyond our means. We can't pay people more than we have in our state coffers.
I, I think what happened in Wisconsin was a was a was a is a huge turning point for this country, and I think that it should give a lot of other states and governors the courage to do what happened in Wisconsin. Uh, the unions have gotten huge, and you know I, you know you you know it, it, the the big union is the teachers union, and. There, there, there are constant increases. You know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but a two and a half in percent increase, a two percent increase year after year after year. A lot of school districts are faced with there are a lot of reassessments. A lot of people are having their properties reassessed. They're having their properties reappraised. Property values are coming down. Uh, you know, but what happened? The the mechanism that Governor Walker, um, you know, imposed in you know through his law in, in Wisconsin that that. Um, did away with the automatic deduction of dues from your paycheck, uh, you know, obviously was dramatic because, you know, the unions, as I read in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago, one third of the union members dropped out of the unions. So that's significant. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, that was and, quite a, you know, <coughs> quite an event. The, the, the amount of money spent by the unions to try to kick Governor Walker out of office, it was a huge number. Just think about what you could do with that money if, if it was funneled back into the education right. system. So. Well, we appreciate you coming in today and being willing to talk with us and, uh, again, uh, sound the warning bell to the American public about our debt load and uh, how it's at a point where we can't sustain it any longer. And it's interesting on how we measure the, the, uh, the national debt because there are some um, an analyses that will say if you look at entitlements and future payments that our national debt could be as much as 124 billion dollars. I don't know if you've seen those studies. Uh, you relied on some of the more the more immediate number, which is is used primarily in, in economic studies. But down the road, we're looking at uh, just unsustainable unsustainable debt. But Scott, thank you so much for coming in, and uh, we'll be right back with the second segment. Let's talk about what's going on in Europe next with Ed Arnold on Behind the Headlines. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals to provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Underwriters of America, a better way for truck insurance. And by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. Welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior uh, Fellow for the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. And on this segment of um, Behind the Headlines, we're joined by Mr. Ed Arnold for a uh, installment of the Arnold Report. Of course, Mr. Arnold is the president of Susquehanna Valley Center's board. Ed, welcome back to the Good show. Good to see you again, Charlie. It's nice to see you. Uh, by the first segment of the show, we talked with Scott Wagner about um, the debt crisis in America. Of course, the debt crisis in America is also, uh, it's, it's not a unique situation. We have a debt crisis in Europe as well, and that seems to even be more overwhelming than our uh, situation here and more pressing and more imminent. Uh, we have a situation right now in the world where it looks like the euro could fail. Uh, could you tell us what's going on in Europe with the new unit of currency, the euro, and what the crisis really, why is there a crisis there, and what does it mean to America and to the American consumers and American here uh, viewers? Well, basically, the thing we have to understand is the euro, which is, of course, a currency, but it is a currency that is used by primarily 17 countries. 17 the, the, countries. That there are the, now, there are some small ones in there, so it's actually more, but 17 countries of consequence. Uh, and they don't have any financial controls. So it's, it's like if we were giving a blank check to each of our states to spend what they want, the one thing we do right in our country is the states theoretically have to balance their budget. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So therefore, we're here. You have this situation where the countries, which are just like our states, really, uh, they don't have to balance their budget, but they're getting the, the umbrella protection, or especially Greece was getting super umbrella protection from being part of the euro. And this is what created the problem. Basically, what you had is a relatively poor country in Greece who was struggling over the years to live within its means. And all of a sudden, you said, look, you poor cousin, we're going to give you unlimited money. You've got a piggy bank. Spend all you want. Mm-hmm. And they issued massive amounts of debt and obviously didn't just spend it did not collect taxes. This is one of their problems. And their economy didn't particularly prosper. It was just a a, uh, unbelievably stupid action. Now, of course, there's also, there was collusion. Goldman Sachs got paid very well fees to issue lots of these billions and billions of bonds. And France advised uh, Greece how to cheat. And so that the common market wouldn't, I mean, the euro wouldn't get too upset. Well, Greece used to have a unit of currency called the drachma. That's and correct. And when they entered the eurozone, they gave up the drachma, and then they adopted uh, adopted euros. And uh, you said that uh, for a while then the euros were pumped into the Greek banks to replace the, the drachma. That's correct. The, the entire drachma. In the old days, if you, if Greece overspent, the drachma would lose its value, and you, there'd, be a, there'd be a check and balance, because if you did something really bad, your currency would suffer. Well, now all of a sudden you're part of this strong currency, primarily driven by Germany and a few other countries, uh, and therefore you you had all of a sudden, instead of borrowing, Greek debt used to be like at 7 8% or more, it dropped to 2 3%, similar to most other countries, because it was backed by the euro, technically, not actually. That's the whole confusion. It isn't. It was an implied, not a legal binding, and that's what they're fighting about right now. And it's it's uh, at the heart of this crisis is the debt problem in Greece, but the other two countries that uh, are of primary concern seem to be Italy and Spain. That's uh, correct. What's happening in Italy and Spain? Uh, well, that I, I think to this problem? one thing you've got to realize is the size. Uh, Greece has a 0.3 trillion economy. France has a 1.5, and Italy has a 2.2. So if you put them together, they are 10 times bigger than Greece. Greece is making a lot of noise, but really the, the crisis is that, in theory, whether you want to keep throwing your money away, if you have a poor cousin that doesn't have a super amount of money, you can just give him a couple hundred bucks and keep him going. When you all of a sudden have a very rich cousin that's at this giant empire, it's going to crumble, and now you've got to give him millions of dollars, or billions in this case, billions of dollars, to keep them going. It's it's beyond your means. You okay. can no longer afford and, it. And the strong countries in the Eurozone have traditionally been France and Germany. Specifically, particularly Germany, uh, has been the economic uh, engine for this this area. Isn't that true? Well, actually, France has not been. France has been pulling the tails and pretended they are. They are a questionable. They have the highest percentage. They are 56 percent of their economy is government. Europe overall average is around 50. We're around 40. Uh, so France basically has living also pretty substantially in more shaky waters. And even though they're large, they're the second largest economy in Europe. And in theory, yes, the people would argue that they are uh, they were one of the pillars. It's a very uh, and now with their new government which is saying we're not going to have any restraints and we're going to spend to make everybody happy, uh, they are, are definitely a question mark country. They cannot be considered one of the strong countries. Well, yeah, well, the, the uh, results of the French election uh, were interesting um, and perhaps uh, uh, not uh, necessarily uh, uh, good news for, um, for uh, some uh, businessmen. Uh, here you find that uh, Sarkozy, the former president, had been raising the retirement age in France, and as soon as the new president came in, he immediately lowered it. Uh, and uh, this is going in the wrong direction from all uh, what all economic trends seem to tell us is the right thing to do. Well, I, I think that the reason, which is a message to America, uh, now this is it's oversimplification to say that there's one point that brings the, the thing down, but in Germany, uh, they are moving towards a 67-year retirement age, similar to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, in France, they just moved back to 60, 
Mm-hmm. And in, in Greece, they're somewhere in the low 50s. The well, low therefore, 50s. you can, so you can see, well, this, the government's paying for this. Because mm-hmm. basically, first of all, they all have a tremendous number of government employees. And this is decreed by the government, so even their companies, why can't they be competitive? Who retires, they, who retires in the early 50s? Uh, that's just amazing, isn't it? Well, yeah. For Americans well, to hear that. That's correct. And this is for Germans to hear it. Mm-hmm. And here the world is saying, Germany, you've got to help Greece. And, and Germans saying, then why don't the Greeks start to play by our rules? And of course, the Greeks are saying, we're Greeks. We don't follow your rules. Well, then don't expect our money. And that, that is really this whole, this whole battle right now where our, uh, I think, our voodoo economists in this country say, we've got to spend more. It, 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 there was a statement, and I don't know if it's a true statement attributed to Einstein, but the fact is if you do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. <laughs> well, we got into this whole trouble. Europe did, we did, by spending too much. So now what's the solution? Spend twice as much and put yourself into deeper, deeper debt. Uh, that, to me, is, is insanity. What we have to do is make our economies more efficient. Not austerity. They keep saying Germany wants austerity. Germany wants these countries to become self-sufficient. They've got to start living within their means. That means stop wasting money. Well, in the last minute and a half, can euro be saved? And uh, what, what do you think is going to uh, happen in the next few months? Uh, the question is, should the euro be saved is even a better question. Unfortunately, what we're dealing with here is if the euro collapses, or at least let's say Greece gets out of it, there will be immediate pain. Uh, but eventually we will recover. If the euro survives and we keep just keep keeping it puttering along in some horrible method of debt, 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 the, the pain is going to be there. It's just going to be spread out, and you aren't solving the problem. Yeah, we have a situation now where in Greece uh, uh, there's been a run on the banks. They're withdrawing a, a billion dollars a day uh, from the Greek banks prior to their election, which will de- largely determine whether or not they stay part of the eurozone or not. But unfortunately, to replace that money that the people are taking out, the the Central European Bank is printing money and putting it back in. So they're simply printing euros and putting it back in. Now, they're doing it through a convoluted method, but that's what they're doing, yes. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like our quantitative easing here. That's exactly right. We're also playing a lot of games with our economy and not, again, living within our means. The only difference between us and Greece is we have the ability to print money because we're the world currency. One of these days, that's going to stop. Greece can't do it because they're part of the euro. If they were the drachma, they could kill the drachma, it would lose its value, but they could eventually come to an equilibrium. Now, they've got to come to discipline, which is very difficult. Okay. Well, we will see very shortly whether or not the euro survives, whether or not the drachma returns or not. And we want to thank you for sharing your insights with us today. I thank you very much. I can't believe that 13 minutes went so fast. <laughs> I, I didn't we get will to be, one uh, We will be right back <laughs> next week with a new edition of Behind the Headlines. You can check us out on the voice of uh, PA.net, and you can see all of our archive shows there, and you can watch us on YouTube as well. Uh, we also have a, a page on uh, Facebook, and we have a Twitter account. So follow Susquehanna Valley Center. We'll see you next time. Thank you.